Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be back again. Um, and I'll just ask you to bear with me a little bit tonight because I will be bouncing around a little bit. There's just so much to talk about. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you the highlights from a few different uh, things going on around the farm. So for, for those who are unfamiliar, the Conservation Action Plan um, is an agreement that was set up with the Park Preserve. Uh, so we had a grazing agreement um, with David Rockefeller on uh, a lot of his Hudson Pines farm lands uh, when the, uh, the planning, the estate planning for transferring that uh, land over to uh, Rockefeller State Park and some of the land to us at Stone Barns happened. Um, and so because of that kind of grandfathering in of the grazing, that caused the park and Stone Barns to sit down and hammer out a, a conservation action plan agreement that governed how we were going to manage this grassland cooperatively um, and using primarily livestock grazing instead of mowing uh, to manage the grasslands. Um, and there were a couple different uh, things that we agreed upon um, and, and a, a couple overarching goals of the, of the cap agreement. Uh, so one is uh, developing resilience or the ability of the ecological system to be self-regulating and self-renewing. Uh, animal health, developing animal health through adaptive, rotational, multi-species grazing and foraging. Native, fostering native biodiversity, so uh, including native field wildflowers and native pollinators. Uh, forage quality and soil conditions, so improving the, the, uh, the quality and health of the forage on the grasslands as well as the soil condition in the grasslands. Control of invasive species, so invasive species prevention and control. Um, and this is, this is a great, if you've uh, been up Buttermilk Hill in the park preserve, you'll know there's a, there's a collection of fields at the bottom of the hill. And then as you start up the Buttermilk Hill Trail up towards the top of the ridge, um, there's one last field kind of behind a tree line, behind the swamp, behind the tree line, and kind of surrounded by uh, woods. Um, and that field has been getting increasingly uh, colonized by multiflora rose. And so this was early this spring, I, I convinced the livestock, uh, the new goat manager to uh, bring in the goats and uh, hit the multiflora rose in that field really hard early in the spring. And they stripped it and then they actually ended up going up into the woods and then they were able, it, it re, because it was early spring, it re-sprouted really fast and they were able to hit it a second time and I'm happy to report there, there was a lot of unhealthy looking multiflora. Uh, a bunch of the bushes seem to succumb to the, uh, the rose disease uh, that's also taking a toll on multiflora rose. Um, so in their weakened condition, they, they ended up contracting the disease. So uh, encouraging and, and I think we'll be able to hit it again next year. And, and by keeping hammering this, I hope to, to, halt that invasion of the field and, and get it back more towards a uh, uh, field. Grassland obligate birds is another goal, uh, particularly nesting by grassland bird species. Uh, one of the, the major targets because we knew they were already hanging around and wanting to nest was the bobolink. Um, and then developing a holistic grasslands management system that that you know balances the grazing uh the conservation goals um and uh managing in a way without herbicides and pesticides um and trying to maintain a healthy ecological balance uh so some just some quick su successes so far uh, so last year, a lot of this data will be from last year because we're still in the process of collecting our data for this year. So uh, even where it's been collected, it may not have been fully analyzed or, or sent out for laboratory testing yet. Um, 
But uh, based on last year's soil testing, every field that we were managing saw an increase in the, the overall soil health score. So this is a composite score based mostly on biological uh, soil health characteristics. Um, and so every field uh, last year saw an increase in uh, the soil health score. Um, and every field was above the minimum, and this is the first time this has happened since, since I started testing, um, all the fields were above the minimum health score expected for our area. So there, you know, out here, if you're familiar with the map, this is our Sleepy Hollow fields off of Sleepy Hollow Road. And there were some old hay fields here that had been pretty severely compacted and had a lot of hay taken out and not a lot put back in. And so they were very nutrient poor. And so this is the first time we've had those, you know, every single field uh, reach over the minimum. Um, and many fields had health score over 30 and, and that's uh, an amazing feat as well. So uh, also carbon sequestration and, and, you know, take this with a grain of salt. This is one estimation method based on one type of laboratory testing um, in one year. But between 2020 and 2021, based on laboratory carbon testing through Woods End Laboratory in Maine, um, we found that we had sequestered at least 583 tons of carbon in the soil between those two years. Um, and that's carbon, not carbon dioxide equivalent. So to get the carbon dioxide equivalent, basically you have to multiply that by 3.7. Um, and so it is equivalent to the carbon dioxide, to put it in more perspective, that's equivalent to the carbon dioxide output of approximately 46 and a half average Westchester County, New York households, including their yearly travel budget. And as you know, West, an average Westchester County, New York household is probably bigger than average. Um, so uh, that was really good news. Um, our vegetable, just our vegetable operations, you can see this little uh, shape here is our greenhouses and these are our vegetable fields. Just within that little space, uh, we sequestered 12 and a half tons of carbon. Uh, but the balance was on the grasslands. And you can see it's not all in one direction. We had some fields, the fields in orange and yellow uh, lost some carbon and the fields in green gained some. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a perfect process. It's we're still working on what management works for some of these heavily impact fields. Um, we have a program going where we may end up doing a little compost spreading just to jumpstart the system in some of those really nutrient poor fields. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress, uh, but it's very encouraging that we were able to, to sequester so much carbon in just a year's time. Uh, through our management. Plant diversity uh, has been a really good story. Um, and this just shows you the change from one year and you may look at it and say, well, that's not very much, but keep in, a, keep in mind that this trend has continued for the last three years of our management. Um, so overall plant species richness has increased each year since the transect started in uh, 2019. Um, average percent native species increased on the transects from 2020 to 2021, and average percent invasive species decreased. Um, plants found previously only on the edges are moving into the fields, and this includes the uh, state listed, uh, I believe it's S2 listed uh, grass, field bee grass, we're finding it spreading everywhere through our pastures under our management, um, which, is, which is a great thing. Um, and uh, goat browsing along the trip, just on an anecdotal measure, but we also see this in the data as well. 
the goat program along the trails and in invasive species dominated areas in the forest uh, seems to be creating room for more native species to grow. We're seeing some flowering spring ephemerals come back. Uh, we're recording more native species on our transects um, and that's been very encouraging as well. Uh, bird diversity, so in grassland obligates. So basically the last three years, we've fledged eight, successfully fledged eight to 10 bobolinks each year. Um, this year we did fledge some, I'm still trying to get an accurate count. It was a little bit of a weird year and I ended up having to go down to DC at the peak of the season for a week. And uh, we had our warm season grass conversion going on. So I'm still trying to get a bead on, uh, I keep hearing them. Uh, but not catching the whole flock so I can get a count of them. Uh, but hopefully I'll be able to pin them down before they leave. Uh, but we did fledge some this year. It may not have been as successful a year. I'm not sure. Uh, last year, we fledged 64 tree swallows, 21 bluebirds, and two house wrens from our bluebird swallow nest box trail. That was an improvement over 2020, but uh, 2020 was still amazing as well, uh, with like 53 bluebirds and nine, uh, sorry, 19 bluebirds and 53 tree swallows. This year, I think our bluebirds are going to be down. We still have one nest with eggs that I'm getting a little nervous may not hatch out. It may have been abandoned. I need to check on it again this week. Um, and we have one tree swallow um, nest that's probably about to fledge if it hasn't already. Um, and then I'll have a final count for this year. Tree swallows, I think, will be on track. Maybe not as good as last year, but still well, well up there. Uh, bluebirds might be a little down because we had a really rough beginning of the year. A lot of failed nests early. We had a kind of a cold period. And um, along with that cold period came some heavy uh, preda avian predation. Um, so it appeared to be, you know, woodpeckers, mockingbirds, maybe house wrens, but it was a little early for them, uh, pulling eggs out of the nest, um, and breaking eggs. So, um, and this was not just us, basically everywhere south of us had the same problem, but apparently north, according to uh, Sandy, our bluebird bander, north of us, uh, they did okay. But us in south, it was it was a pretty rough beginning of the year for the bluebirds, uh, although they have since rebounded. Between 2019 and 2020, overall bird diversity increased. Um, we had Eastern Meadowlarks, Meadowlarks sighted for the first time in both spring and fall migrations. Um, in 2021, uh, I did not see them this spring, but I'm, I'm hoping maybe we'll see them again this fall. I'd really like to convince some of the, the fledglings to, uh, you know, the juveniles to stick or come back and breed, um, maybe with the warm season grass conversion that will help. Uh, but it was encouraging to see them, uh, fairly regularly during migration, uh, for the first time. Um, and then, you know, you mentioned swallows for the first time in, in my knowledge, I mean, not that they haven't been there, but, um, we had today when I was out on the field doing some other work, we had, uh, purple martins hanging out on our feet, like hanging out in the trees, interact, getting chased by tree swallows. Um, and so I'm thinking we need to get some gourds up for next year and start yet another successful purple martin colony uh, over by stone barns to complement the ones at Rockwood Hall and Croton Point. Uh, insect diversity, I'm going to go into this in a little more detail because uh, since I made this, we've gotten some more detail in. This has been super exciting for me. Um, it's made me want to go back and get a second PhD in entomology uh, because there's just, it's so interesting and fascinating. Uh, but we've been using DNA barcoding to uh, categorize our insect uh, 
population um, and build an agroecological DNA library that then can be used by other organizations in the region to do a uh, relatively low cost, high accuracy uh, insect monitoring. So uh, I'm super excited about that program. Um, and just lots of cool ecological stories uh, as I sift through this and find what species we have and learn about their biology and what's known and what's not known. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about tonight is our native warm season grass restoration project. So if you're a regular at the preserve, you may have noticed that uh, there's been some tilling out in the buttermilk area and on field 40, which is the big long field along 448, just on the other side, starts on the other side of the tunnel uh, when you come down underneath 448 from buttermilk. It's on the left side and continues all the way to Stone Barn's main drive. Um, and a portion of that has, has also been tilled. Um, so this is part of our uh, native warm season grass restoration. Uh, this is research funded by the Wildlife Conservation Society it's from a grant from the Wildlife, a climate adaptation grant from the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, and we're also partnering with the Center for Native Grasslands at the University of Tennessee. Uh, to do additional research on top of that restoration, looking at how farmers can work with different soil conditions like uh, pH and phosphorus levels, as well as things like the amount of shade, the amount of rainfall, um, to get successful uh, warm season establishments on their properties. And, you know, if they have a choice of more than one field, um, what might work best, or if they, you know, have a field that's really productive and then they have fields that's not productive, can they put that non-productive one into this conversion so they can keep going with their their most their more productive field. So uh, we've funded a postdoc uh, who's doing that research through uh, the lab of uh, Dr. Pat Kaiser, at the director of the Center for Native Grasslands. Um, so why warm season grasses? Well, they're more likely to thrive under predicted climate conditions. Uh, so particularly during the mid to late summer, because we, we are predicted to be wetter overall, but a lot of that moisture will come during the winter and spring. And then we expect to have long periods that are hot and dry uh, during the mid to late summer. Uh, because these grasses are native species, they're more ideal wildlife habitat, particularly for native specialists that spend part of their life cycle on native grass species. Um, it creates a preferred habitat structure for grassland obligate birds and better structure for winter wildlife to use. Um, potentially, there's higher and more stable carbon sequestration. Uh, particularly under predicted climate conditions. If you look at a lot of the research right now, the um, warm season grasses and the cool season grasses are kind of neck and neck. You know, some studies show one, some studies show the other, some studies show them, you know, pretty much statistically even in terms of carbon sequestration because the C4, those warm season grasses are more efficient at photosynthesis in capturing that carbon but they have a shorter season than the, the long season for the cold, uh, cold season grasses or C3 photosynthesis grasses. And we expect as climate conditions change, that's going to tip the scales in the favor of these uh, warm season. In addition, they have a much deeper root structure. And so the potential to get that carbon down to even deeper, more stable levels of the soil um, is, is uh, a good possibility. We're hoping this will also provide improved summer grazing for livestock when the cool season pastures go into dormancy, which also allows us to rest our cold season pastures for longer periods um, which will improve the wildlife habitat value of those fields as well. Uh, and possibly uh, 
add potential for winter stockpile. So we reduce the need to bring in outside hay or other feed resources. Uh, so what will the process look like? So the conversion process, um, we're uh, gonna have, we have approximately 30 acres tilled and in cover crops this year. Uh, 15 of those acres will be planted with native warm season grasses in the spring of 2023. The other 15 acres will undergo a second round of cover cropping uh, and planted with native warm season grasses in 2024. The reason for that cover crop, those cover cropping rotations is to try to shade out and exhaust the weed bed so we get a much more uh, successful warm season grass restoration without resorting to herbicides, which uh, the park preserve has, this is all on park preserve land and the park preserve has promise the neighbors that they will not use herbicides. Um, the final 20 acres of the conversion approximately will be tilled and planted with cover crops in 2023, and then a second season of cover crops before the native warm season grass uh, seeding in the spring of 2025. So fully mature establishment and return to a normal grazing rotation or, you know, a adapted one for warm season uh, is expected in all parcels by the summer of 2028. So it's a bit of a process. Um, and you can see this is, gives you a visual representation of um, how that uh, will proceed on the different parts of the conversion. And again, I'm happy uh, at the, during the Q&A to drop a link to this story map in the chat if anyone's interested. Um, where is the conversion happening? So uh, you're looking at an overhead view of the fields below Buttermilk Hill. So this is the, uh, the Buttermilk Hill Trail basically is right here. Um, and then that's the three-way junction to go out to Lucy's Loop uh, or continue towards Buttermilk or back down towards Stone Barns. Uh, this is the tunnel, and then this is that first section of the field before the pond, um, between the tunnel and the pond on that long field that goes all the way to the Stone Barns entrance. So right now, this field and this area, so the gray and green are uh, planted in cover crops. There's one small three acre test strip that we immediately planted with warm season grasses right in the middle of this field. Um, and that was to help fine tune the, both the planting and the research process. So when we do the full planting, we've got everything kind of all the kinks worked out and we maximize our success of both the research and the, the establishment and restoration. Um, and then this, this purple region or blue region is, is what will be um, tilled next year um, and then go through a two year cover crop rotation. Some visual expectations um, of the conversion process. So there will be tilling because we're using tilling and cover cropping to manage the weed bed and to kill out the uh, aggressive cold season species um, instead of using herbicides. Um, there, during some phases, there will be some exposed soil. We are trying to minimize that and we've left some cold season strips in to on slopes to help prevent, you know, a, a unprecedented rainfall, like the four something inches we had on Monday um, from creating a ravine in the field and washing away our soil. Um, early establishment may not look full. This does not mean the restoration has failed. So um, it may look a little messy at first because these warm season grasses take a while really to hit their stride. Um, but we have, we're consulting with experts who have done this over and over again. And so they're going to be letting us know how to, how to manage it and, and make sure that, uh, we get a really good establishment. The research process again with staff from the center for the native grass for, uh, 
Native Grasslands Management at the University of Tennessee. Uh, we'll be consulting. Um, research will take place two months each year over three years. Um, we're, we have two, we're gonna have 270 meter square plots controlling for 15 combinations of variables. So light, rain, you know, water saturation, rain, soil moisture, uh, pH, phosphorus, etc. cetera. Um, some plots or many plots will have rain out or shade shelters uh, for the two months. So you may see some structures out on the fields. Don't be alarmed. Again, that's part of research, which is going to help us be able to inform Northeast farmers about how to do this successfully um, and how to choose between different fields they might want to convert at to, as to which one will give them the most successful uh, conversion. And that just means more native habitat. Final result will be taller grasses, greener in high summer, golden and reddish brown in the fall and winter. You may be familiar with like, this is actually a picture I took this spring along the edge of the trail in buttermilk. So there are already some little blue stem plants and some broom sedge, bloom, broomstead, broom sedge, blue stem plants along the edge. Um, and you get that nice, beautiful bunch grass, coppery bunch grass structure. Um, more tall bunch grasses and plants left for habitat in the winter, giving it a kind of a coarser texture. Uh, we will be planting climate adaptive and grazing tolerant wildflowers for pollinator habitat throughout and more concentrated in some key areas. Uh, so hopefully we'll see more native butterflies, more grassland obligate birds, more raptors year round and better wildlife habitat in general. Uh, so I'm just, the other thing I wanted to get into today is just talk a little bit about our insect biodiversity monitoring in more detail because we've been getting some really exciting data in on that. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip through some of this introductory stuff. Again, I'm happy to share. Um, this just talks a little bit about how the DNA barcoding works and how, why we're doing it. Uh, but I wanted to skip straight to the results. Um, so uh, this is from our library. So the way DNA barcoding works is you submit a whole bunch of samples, over 10,000 samples. The, each one is individually, the DNA is extracted, it's photographed, um, and then that DNA is sequenced. And from that sequence uh, of uh, mitochondrial gene, they build a barcode. So each letter, there's four bases that make up the DNA and you each of those starts with a different letter, A, T, C, and G. And so if you assign a color to each of those letters, when you put the DNA in place and put a bar for what color is in that spot, you end up with a barcode. And that's basically what a DNA barcode is. Um, and so you have to build a library that has the barcodes matched to your specimens. And then you can do what's called meta barcoding. So you can grind them all up run them all at once in a bulk sample, it's much, much cheaper. And then it just outputs a bunch of bar barcodes and you scan those against your library and get uh, identifications. So from our DNA barcoding library, you can see um, the these are the orders that were represented in our sample. And so you can see partially because of the type of trapping uh, we're using, but also because they're very numerous. Uh, diptera or the flies were our, like by far and far and away, the largest portion of the sample. But then we also have Hymenoptera, which is the bees, wasps, and ants. Hemiptera, which is the true bugs. So stink bugs and, and, um, cicada in cicada relatives, um, things like that. We have Coleoptera, which is the beetles. Lepidoptera, which is the butterflies and moths. Orthoptera here is the grasshoppers. 
Entomobryomorpha is one that uh, many people might not have heard of. These are the springtail, or this is one order of springtails. There's another order in these little thin bars you see over here. But 4% but of our sample was this uh, particular group of springtails, which are soil dwelling organisms. Uh, we have some wood lice. Uh, Ariane is the spiders at 3%. Uh, mesostigmata is a uh, uh, mite uh, order. Uh, we have another mite order represented as well. So you, it gives you kind of an idea of, of what, what we sampled. Um, and then if we look at um, the success of the identification, 30% of our sample was ID'd to the species level. And within that, um, actually it's up to now, uh, researchers keep kind of chiming in and doing work on our sample. And so we're now up to 516 unique species identified. Uh, another 28% was ID'd to the genus level only, um, but there were, um, approximately 700 unique genera identified. So that means really we have, if we have 700 different genera, we have at least 700 species um, and probably a significant amount more. 28% uh, of the sample was the, the family or subfamily level. Um, and we had uh, 216 unique families represented in our, uh, arthropod families uh, represented in our sample. And then you can see about 13% and maybe a little more um, was at the order or higher level. And the, the, mostly that accounts for samples that uh, the DNA was contaminated uh, or the DNA just didn't amplify or sequence at all. So they, they got no result. And that's, you know, that's kind of normal with DNA work. Um, unfortunately, there are some interesting things in there, like the um, mutilids, which we actually did morphologically ID to the family level. Uh, the mutilids, basically the primer they use works for most arthropods, but things like the velvet ants, um, it, it doesn't work for their DNA. Um, so you end up getting a contaminated sample because it just amplifies what other contamination is there. Um, and there's a family of wasps that are the uh, Sephiranidae that also they're parasitic wasps and they also did not amplify with, with the primers that they use for general work. Uh, but some really cool results from this is being able to then go look at the ecology. So this little parasitic wasp, and, you know, keep in mind, this is the bottom of a microscopic well plate. So this is a very small little wasp. Um, this is a uh, parasitoid wasp from the family Briconidae and uh, the genus Aphidius, um, probably Aphidius robolacifi. Um, and wasps of this subfamily, uh, aphidinini, uh, are known as the aphid mummy wasps. So the female lays a single egg on each host aphid. The larvae actually mummify the host aphid and then pupate inside the dried, hardened husk of the host remains. So kind of creepy, but really cool. And, you know, from a um, farmer standpoint, having a natural aphid control is a wonderful thing. Um, so we, we love these guys. Um, and these, these were found on our back pasture out behind the center uh, in July and another one in the, uh, one of the buttermilk hill fields uh, in June. Uh, this is Myopharis aberrans, uh, which uh, is a fly from the Tachinid family, Tachinidae, um, and these are parasitoids of other arthropods, often caterpillars. In this case, this tach Tachinid species is a parasitoid of potato beetles. So again, it is a natural source of uh, insect control for our garden. 
uh, potato beetles love the solanaceae plants. So uh, peppers, potatoes, um, but they also exist on uh, Carolina horse nettle, which is a uh, native which grows in our pastures as well, uh, which is in the same family. Um, this individual was captured in 44. Uh, the field that's near the grassland pond on that big long field out front uh, in August. Um, and so again, we love to see this and we this gives us an idea what to look for and, and find out how we can foster more habitat for these things. Since again, we are not using pesticides in our garden, we look towards fostering these biocontrol species which can help keep our uh, pest populations in check. Uh, <laughs> excuse me if I massacre the pronunciation, a gorillus smaragdifrons, uh, which is a beetle. Um, the cool thing about this beetle is actually it's, you may, it, you may have saw it and said, oh my God, emerald ash borer. Um, it is a relative of the emerald ash borer, but um, it does to invasive tree of heaven trees what the emerald ash borer did to ashes. Um, and we found this um, on our property, which is interesting news. This is an introduced species, but so far the, the information is it's totally a biocontrol agent on Tree of Heaven, um, and it is not uh, known to transfer to any other trees as of yet, so it only seems to be a threat to the invasive Tree of Heaven trees, which also our host trees for spotted, spotted lanternfly, which is a, another uh, big issue confronting us. Um, so this may be a really effective control. Supposedly, supposedly it was introduced accidentally and was not an intentional biocontrol release, um, but it may help us out. Uh, People ask, are there anything that was surprising? Um, this was a surprise, but not a good one. Um, we found out that the vast majority of ticks we collected in our grassland samples um, are a DNA match for the Asian longhorn tick, Haemophysialis longicornis. Um, and this is an invasive tick first documented in the US in 2017. While it is not a vector for Lyme disease, it can carry uh, a lot of other tick-borne livestock and human diseases, including the uh, alpha-gal, which gives you the red meat allergy. Um, and it can be a huge problem for livestock through sheer numbers because the females reproduce parthenogenically, so they do not need a male. Um, and they can lay up to like 10,000 eggs at a time. So you can have one female hitch a ride, drop off somewhere else and start a new population. So this isn't going to be an up and coming problem for the Northeast, I think, unless something turns the tide. And right now, I don't know of anything. Uh, getting back to some good news, um, this tiny little wasp, again, this is the bottom of a microplate. Um, this tiny specimen is called Copidosoma floridanum. It's a parasitoid wasp in the Encirtidae family. Um, and it turns out this species is a pa parasitoid of the Placeaeae moth family, which are the looper moths, which are some of the most destructive agricultural pests. Um, and the larva of many species in this looper moth family, they vigorously attack things like soybean, brassicas, potatoes, tomatoes, radishes, beans, and cowpeas. And in fact, because Copidosoma floridanum is such a valuable biocontrol agent for agriculture with a huge economic impact, it was chosen by the Human Genome Project as one of the arthropod species that they will be sequencing its entire genome as part of their new arthropod uh, project. Um, so we detected this in the Sleepy Hollow area as well as near the center. 
Um, and, you know, without the DNA barcoding, it's likely we never would have known this little uh, thing was here uh, helping us out. And now we can learn about it and learn how to uh, manage for it to, to help us again avoid having to take other management actions to control uh, pests in the garden. We're also this year, we have started a targeted insect collection, which has just been inspiring. Uh, some of our key pollinator species do not get captured in the passive traps uh, of our insect transects. Um, so to fully understand our pollinator ecology, or particularly around the gardens and landscaping of the center, we're expanding this DNA barcoding library by uh, actively seeking out and trapping these species that have not been sampled. And I'll tell you, I, what I expected and what we have found is <laughs> probably an order of magnitude different. We have found so many new species of, uh, you know, particularly bees and hoverflies and wasps that I did not know is we're here. Uh, we're also documenting our butterfly population, which was not well represented. So this has been really inspiring work and, and uh, I hope will bear fruit later. I realize we're getting late, so I think I'll stop it there and uh, open it up to questions or whatever you want to do, Anne.